both those of you who are here on campus today as well as those, those who, are who are participating, participating online, online to, the to the 2022, 2022 James, James D. Strauss, Strauss Worldview View Lectureship. In March of 1995, a committee of Lincoln Christian Seminary faculty first launched this lectureship in order to honor the legacy of a longtime professor of theology and philosophy, Dr. James D. Strauss. Those of us who were his students will always remember Dr. Strauss's defining vision taken from the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians 10.5, to bring every thought captive to Christ. Each October then, since 1996, this lectureship has invited some of the finest minds in the Christian world to address a wide variety of disciplines, including the areas of biblical studies, theology, philosophy, apologetics, and contemporary culture. This year's lecturer is no exception to that rule. We are honored to have him here with us today. I first met Dr. Gary Selby, professor of ministerial formation at Emanuel Christian Seminary at Millican College a little over 20 years ago. I could say just before the turn of the century, but that would make us both sound older than we will ever admit to. Uh, but Gary might remember that meeting. It was at the annual meeting of the National Communication Association in Chicago. And um, I'd say he might remember that day or sometimes psychological defense mechanisms kick in and then you forget things. But uh, he was presenting a paper on a panel sponsored by the Religious Communication Association, teaching at George Washington University at the time. And he was joined on that panel by Dr. Neil LaRue from the University of Minnesota at Morris and myself, then a professor at Kentucky Christian College. And he, he may or may not have known that even then he was in a position very similar to the one he finds himself in today, surrounded by Lincoln leaders, because both Neil and I had studied under Dr. Strauss while students here at Lincoln. In the years to follow, Dr. Selby would eventually serve at Pepperdine University as the Carl P. Miller Chair of Communication and Director of the University's Center for Faith and Learning, where he developed the Communitas Pastoral Leadership Program, and during which time he also, in the year 2013, served as keynote presenter for the McLeod Lectures on Preaching at Princeton Theological Seminary. He then joined the faculty at Emanuel in 2017. Dr. Selby has published several works on Christian rhetoric and religion in the public sphere, including Martin Luther King and the Rhetoric of Freedom, The Exodus in America's Struggle for Civil Rights, published by Baylor University Press, not with Wisdom of Words, Non-Rational Persuasion in the New Testament, published by Erdmans, and most recently, Pursuing an Earthly Spirituality, C.S. Lewis and Incarnational Faith, published by IVP Academic. By the way, we have copies of that available for you to purchase today at a discounted price on a little table at the back of our auditorium this morning. Since meeting Dr. Selby, I followed his career with great interest and have been consistently impressed with the interdisciplinary perspective he brings to his work, as well as his concern for worldview issues. And anyone who actually knew Dr. Strauss would know that that makes Gary an excellent choice to present this lectureship. The theme of this year's lectureship is a mysticism for the rest of us. C.S. Lewis, Beauty and the Nearness of God. And his first lecture this morning is titled, Ravished by Beauty, Glimpses of Glory. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gary Selby to Lincoln Christian University. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's a joy to be here. I know for those of you who are local, this is maybe not quite the circumstances you would have envisioned uh, two or three or four years ago. And um, our heart goes out to you. We have had some similar kinds of struggles um, back where I come from, and so um, we've, we feel that. But I'm also deeply honored that you invited me, and I'm deeply honored to be here with you. And um, I want to say that um, I come at all of these things 
as a pastor more than anything else. And so it has been a blessing to me to work through this material. Uh, I've told several people, um, whenever you get an invitation like this, it's a chance for you to look at what you've been working on and think, all right, what can I, how can I move this ball a little further? And so, um, so, it, so I figured even if no one was here, I had so much fun working on this. So everything else, the fact that you're here is gravy. So uh, thank you so much, and it's been a, it's a deep honor. I bring you greetings from uh, Van Barnett. Some of you will know Van. He was a student here, and he was um, he's wonderful. He's doing a great job at Emmanuel, and um, I'm probably not allowed to say this, but send more like him. So that's all I'll say. Um, let me say just a word about the books. Uh, so. The way this works is when you publish a book, they publish a whole bu- they print a whole bunch of them and they sell as many as they can. And then after a while, they want to clear the warehouse out. And so they offer the author a good deal on them and they sent me a bunch. And so I brought those. And so I'm passing that along to you for any of you who want um, for 10 bucks. So that's a pretty good deal. Um, last thing I want to say is I want to dedicate these um, talks to my mom. Some of you have, may have heard this. My mom passed away just this past Sunday. And um, it's a long um, journey with Alzheimer's that she's been through. And uh, we got the word. Things were, were kind of heading in that direction pretty quickly. Dropped everything, drove down Thursday, and spent um, Thursday night with her. I spent most of um, uh, Friday, sitting by her bed, playing my guitar, singing to her. I actually read the eulogy that I'm going to give at her funeral. I read her eulogy, so uh, so she got to hear her eulogy. And then um, uh, Saturday morning, uh, my brother and I gathered around her bed and just played hymns for an hour or so before I got in the car and left. And she um, she was uh, she was pretty uh, non-responsive, but she came back to sing. She was just kind of you could tell her straining to join in those. Um, voices. And so, um, and Sarah asked me, do you really want to do this? And I said, yeah, mom would say, go do it. And so, um, and I I dedicate these to her because she was probably the one, the earliest in my life, who taught me to pay attention to beauty. And so, mom, these are for you. A couple of years ago, I was reading in Exodus 24, a text I know I've read scores of times, But this time, something hit me that I had never noticed before, or at least I had not noticed with a level of force that it hit me this time. Um, If you're familiar with that story in Exodus 24, the chapter opens with God's invitation um, for Moses and Aaron and Aaron's two sons and um, the 70 elders all to come up Mount Sinai a little ways. And then we get the account of Moses uh, taking all the instructions for the altar, the sacrifices, all the stipulations for ceremonial purity, all that he takes um, down to the people, and he puts the system of worship in place, all the objects and rituals that signal and embody um, Israel's relationship with Yahweh. But then something most uncanny happens. Moses and Aaron and the others get to come closer. They actually get to come um, into the presence of the God of Israel. It's like they're going to experience the reality for which all of those rituals and objects were mere symbols and shadows. Here's what the text says in Exodus 24, verse 9. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders went up. They saw the God of Israel. Under God's feet, there was something like a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. God did not lay a hand on the chief men of the Israelites. They beheld God, and they ate and drank. Whoa. Somehow, they see the God of Israel, the God that... um, who will later say to uh, Moses in Exodus 33, no one can see me and live. But you also get a sense that they're unable to lift their eyes beyond God's feet and the pavement on which God's throne stands because that's all the narrator really talks about. We want a description of God, and all we get is a description of the floor. We have this sense of the power of the one in whose presence they stand. It's like the narrator is almost surprised that the glory of God didn't just obliterate them on the spot. Even more odd is the fact that no words are exchanged. 
either from God to humans or humans to God or humans to each other. It seems like they have a direct experience, unmediated by words, of God's glowing presence. And then they eat and drink before God. But the thing that jumped out at me was a description of the pavement, the the pavement, the floor on which the throne of God is sitting. The New International Version calls it a pavement made of lapis lazuli, as bright blue as the sky. Lapis lazuli. For some reason, I never noticed that before. And so like any good scholar, I looked up lapis lazuli on Wikipedia. And it's a deep blue semi-precious stone prized since antiquity for its intense color, mined in what is now northern Afghanistan. But it shows up in artifacts of royalty across the the ancient Near East, including the burial mask of King uh, Pharaoh, um, Egyptian Pharaoh Tutankhamun. He's got lapis lazuli in his death mask. And so I thought about that description, and it took me back to the sunset sky over the Santa Monica Mountains when we lived out in Southern California, especially around this time of year. Uh, In Southern California, this is the point where the hot Santa Ana winds are blowing. It's also fire season, but it's it's the point where the Santa Ana winds have blown impurities and humidity all out into the ocean. And so it's the, it's the period of time where the sky is at its clearest, and the sun would set just below the horizon. And the edge of the mountains would glow a deep orange, and then as your eye moved up, it would go to gray and then to a blue that grew deeper and more intense with a hint of purple as it moved toward darkness. And I would stand on my balcony and stare at the sky, It was so beautiful. The narrator of our text cannot begin to describe God. All they can do is try to capture the splendor of the floor on which the throne of God sits. And it's a scene of such intense beauty that it hurts. This is just one of many texts that capture these theophany moments, moments when people often unexpectedly find themselves caught up in the presence of God. Moses in Exodus 33, where God hides Moses in the cleft of the rock and then passes by so that Moses can see God's glory from the backside. The call of Isaiah in Isaiah 6, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And his glory filled the temple. And what you get in Isaiah, as Isaiah's account is it's not just power, but there's also a sense of sublime grandeur, the purity of God's presence, because Isaiah's immediate response is not fear, but rather a sense of his own uncleanness, of his own unworthiness, a desire for purity and goodness. Ezekiel's vision of the four living creatures and the throne of God in Ezekiel 1, the wheel that has the appearance of a substance called beryl. A beryl was was a, a stone that had hues of green and yellow and blue and pink. Um, And then the throne of God is the color of sapphire or lapis lazuli again. Um, And again, although there is great power and moral purity there, the final word in Ezekiel's vision is a word of beauty. There was splendor all around, the text says. Verse 28 of Ezekiel 1, like the rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day, such was the appearance of the splendor all around. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God. Notice something about that text. Ezekiel is piling on modifiers. Uh, this, This phraseology, the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God, it's like Any description so falls so short, the experience is ineffable beyond words that Ezekiel is grasping for images that might give us some far-off hint of what it was really like. And then, of course, John's vision of the throne in Revelation 4, there's this light show, and he sees the colors of the rainbow again, and there's music and singing, and the elders who are all around the throne erupt in worship. They can't do otherwise. 
In these theophany texts, we get this recurring theme of getting caught up in the presence of God. They encounter the glory of God. And there's power, but they're also taken into an experience of joyful, excruciating beauty. So it's, it's not just the power of a nuclear explosion. There's color, and there's light, and sometimes there's music. You get this sense of, of, um, of a, an ecstatic synesthesia where their senses converge in a moment of overwhelming rapture. It's like they're about to explode. And although the text doesn't explicitly say this, it's hard to imagine that they are not feeling such intense pleasure in that moment. I, I think about Moses as he went on to lead the people. There were times of dryness <laughs> and frustration and loneliness. And in those times, I wonder if his mind didn't go back to that moment when he saw the backside glory of the Lord. They don't manufacture these moments. They can't flip a switch and make them come on. They don't control its coming and going. But they do cooperate with God in the process. They do put themselves in a stance of receptivity. Moses begs for it. Isaiah and John both have their visions um, in the context of worship, and their lives are never the same. They find themselves answering a call to ministry, overcome with a reckless abandonment to the will of God. They find energy and motivation and hope. Well, these encounters with God that we see in Scripture seem to have a parallel in the history of Christianity, in the tradition of Christian mysticism. In figures like Mechthild of Magdeburg, with her vivid descriptions of knowing God that evoke the erotic language of the Song of Songs, Juliana of Norwich with her divine showings, John of the Cross with his poem about encountering his beloved Christ, Catherine of Siena, and so many others. In fact, Christianity itself is born out of these encounters. Visitations of angels, the transfiguration, Pentecost, Paul on the road to Damascus, the prayer of Ephesians 1, that God might give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that the eyes of our hearts might be enlightened, so that we might be filled with hope as we glimpse the riches of the glorious inheritance that God has in store for us. It seems like he's describing a deeper kind of knowing than just mere intellectual grasp on Christian doctrine. He's describing something visceral and intuitive. Paul, in Romans 5, God has poured divine love into our hearts through faith. Again, a, a deeper, more intuitive kind of knowing than just an intellectual grasp on the fact of God's love, as important as that is. Um, Peter mentioned my book, um, Not With Wisdom of Words. One of the things I I noticed as I was working on that, and I didn't make the connection until I was preparing these talks, that the New Testament often contains poetic language and form designed not so much to explain or argue, but rather to take us up into moments of transport, ecstasis. So Romans 7, we get this argument about um, an explanation about the role of the law in God's plan. And we need that. We need the intellectual part. But then at the end of Romans 7, we get this powerful, emotional, dramatic vision of Paul enacting despair, the despair of the person who just can't get it right, all leading to the bliss of grace. Who will save me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. At the beginning of that book, I compared it to going to a lecture about the joys of French cooking. So you could sit in the lecture hall and you could hear all about the joys of French cooking and why French cooking is wonderful and far to be desired above all other cooking. Um, but the only way you were going to really experience the truth of that was what? Taste and see that the cuisine is good. You, you have to taste it. And so that's part of what we see even in Scripture, these experiences, these, this language that takes us into the experience. 
And running through all of these is what Evelyn Underhill in her classic work on mysticism described as the direct intuition or experience of God. It is non-discursive in the sense that we're not engaged in talk about, but rather we are in. And that makes it ineffable, incapable of being put into words. Imagine trying to explain the color blue to a person blind from birth who's never seen the sky. The mystical experience is marked by a sense of transport, which is the root word from which we get ecstasy, ecstasis. As David Downing writes in his wonderful book, Into the Regions of Awe, one of the most common mystical experiences is a sense of sudden joy or transport, a glad awareness of being lifted up to grasp a higher harmony. In those moments, we experience a kind of a sense of unity in all things, what some have called the unitive consciousness, as if we are glimpsing what the writer of Ephesians and Colossians point to as a foretaste of where God is taking all things, bringing all things together in Christ. They are transitory experiences. Often they come, and then the person who has received them will write about them and explain them after the fact. Julian of Norwich does this. John of the Cross does this. Paul does this. And then what really matters about these experiences is that their lives are changed forever. Now, when we look at the history of God's dealings with people, it's clear that not everyone experiences this, or at least experiences it as dramatically as John or Juliana or Isaiah or Moses. It's like a foretaste of what all of us will know at the resurrection. But there are those few to whom God gives that foretaste while they are still in this life, on this side of the resurrection. When we look at that history, what we find often is that those to whom that gift is given are often those who are called to uniquely difficult, risky ministry, or perhaps even called to martyrdom. Stephen, as he's being pummeled, bloodied by stone after stone, suddenly cries out in a mystical vision, I see heaven opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Think about Paul. Think about the ministry to which God was calling Paul, the hardship and deprivation and risk he would take. Think about the role he was going to play in articulating the meaning of Christ's death and resurrection. And so he's given these mystical experiences in, that he describes in 2 Corinthians 12. Juliana of Norwich had her vision from God in the midst of life-threatening illness. John of the Cross, who wrote the, we know of him um, from the dark night of the soul. You've probably heard that phrase. He was barely out of his teen years, caught up with Teresa of Avila and reforming the Carmelite order. And when he refused to stop, he was tortured by the very people who had taught him Scripture imprisoned in a tiny cell, and then brought out when the brothers were eaten. And he was beaten as he watched them eat their meal. You get the idea that the mystical experience, these uh, transitory direct encounters with the presence of God did not come to everyone. And they were often reserved for those who would face special suffering for the cause of Christ. Now, that's a long introduction. <laughs> but that long introduction leads to this question. What about the rest of us? Is this encounter with the joyful, ecstatic life of God reserved only for a few? Or is it a possibility for all of us? Is there a mysticism for the rest of us? And I believe the answer is yes. And it is rooted in our capacity to be attentive to that quality which marks those biblical theophanies that characterizes what those saints experience when they encounter the glory of God. And that is beauty. 
beauty as the visceral, embodied apprehension of the glory of God. And that's what I want to explore in these three talks. I'm going to tell you up front, here's my central thesis. The beauty that the mystics experienced as a central feature of the glory of God what Moses and the 70 elders saw in that pavement of lapis lazuli has been suffused through all creation. And how could it not if it is God's creation? That God has incarnated God's self in all creation. Some have called this panentheism. Not pantheism, where all is God, but panentheism, where the presence of God is suffused in all creation. I want to argue that our experiences of beauty represent encounters with the glory of God. Indeed, that God's glory is uniquely touches our senses when we encounter beauty. And that we, by being carefully attentive, to beauty and to pleasure, have the possibility of moving together more deeply into the presence of God in a way that glimpses that mystical experience of our mothers and fathers in the faith. And that I believe gives us a winsome, compelling message to the world at a moment when Christianity, at least in the West, is not doing that well. My conversation partner for these talks is uh, C.S. Lewis. A few others will, will join us, but principally Lewis. And uh, that might surprise you because we usually think of Lewis as the rational thinker, the one who gives cogent arguments about God and Jesus and suffering and so forth. And certainly he is that. But Lewis was very much drawn to the mystics. His own journey to faith was in some sense a mystical journey. His experiences of what he called joy if you've read, how many of you have read Surprised by Joy? Anybody read Surprised by Joy? Okay, you need to read it if you haven't read it. Uh, but those moments when uh, he describes his brother Warney coming in and showing him this little toy garden that he had made in the lid of a cookie tin, or a moment when he sees a current tree in full bloom, or the first time he hears the strains of Wagner opera. <laughs> These are mystical encounters, Lewis is describing. And in a way, his own process of coming to faith is centered on making sense of those ecstatic experiences. As a Christian writer, he had read many of the mystics, and he drew on their wisdom. Juliana of Norwich was a special favorite, but also Bernard of Clairvaux and John of the Cross and Walter Hilton and others. Uh, as David Downing notes, Lewis's imaginative fiction, the science fiction trilogy, and also the Chronicles of Narnia. How many of you read the Chronicles? Anybody read the Chronicles? Okay, we get a few more hands with the Chronicles. That's a great way in. Uh, they are filled with allusion to mystical experiences. Um, for the, the um, science fiction trilogy, uh, think about the cosmic dance with which the character Ransom is taken up in at the end of the book Paralandra. Um, in Letters to Malcolm, Lewis talks about mystical prayer, the prayer without words. And yet, he seemed to recognize that this experience was reserved for only a few. And he recognized that he wasn't one of them. <laughs> so he loved it, he was drawn to it, but as a Christian, he was not one of those on whom this experience came. And yet, I believe Lewis gave us a framework and a practice that will open us up to the kind of visceral presence of God that marked the mystic's experience. And that was sent, and it's centered in our experiences and attention to beauty and pleasure. And so for the rest of this talk in the last few minutes that I have, I want to explore what he says about pleasure and beauty uh, as glimpses of the glory of God. And then later today at the, at the noon hour, um, I want to talk a little bit about what gets in the way. What are those things, especially in our cultural moment, that keep us from being attentive to beauty as the glory of God. And then finally in the afternoon, um, I want to explore uh, what he says practically about how this becomes real to us. How do we practice this so that we open ourselves up to this sense of the presence of God? 
So for that outline, I'm drawing on one of my absolute favorite uh, Lewis texts, Letter 17 of Letters to Malcolm. I hope you have a copy of that. I'll be referring to it in all three lectures. Um, and so um, now I, I, I will just say one word. Um, the top of that, I actually included a little piece from uh, his, his book, Reflections on the Psalms, where he talks about worship. And I just include that because it's just such a helpful way of thinking about worship. I don't know about you, but I grew up with this sense that, you know, God had sort of said to all, created all these humans and said, now you like line up in church and worship me or I'm going to, I'm going to send you to hell. As if God was somehow needful of our worship, <laughs> you know, and I, I remember as a, as a, Upper elementary school kid being out in the backyard one summer afternoon, a hot August summer afternoon, singing an anthill and watching these little ants scurry around. I thought, you know, we're kind of, I'm kind of to these ants as God is to me. I was like kind of a weird kid, I guess. And it was, and I immediately what came into my head was like, it's almost as if I was going to say, all you ants, you worship me or I'm going to stomp on your anthill. And that was the theology of worship that I grew up with. And I remember at the moment thinking, wow, that is so egotistical, um, as if God is needy of our worship. And what, what Lewis says in that passage is that um, God doesn't need our worship, that worship, that praise is the natural human response to enjoyment. When you enjoy something, whether it's a beautiful view or a good meal or good music, you praise it, you praise it, um, and you invite others to praise it with you. You, you, you see a beautiful scene and others are, others are standing around you and go, look at that, isn't it beautiful? You sit, sit down at a good meal and you eat that first bite and you think, oh, this steak is so good. And then you hand a bite across the, uh, the table to the person sitting with you and said, try this, you gotta try this, it's so good. And you invite them into praise. So Lewis says, we praise what we enjoy. And in fact, he says, you have not fully, pr you have not fully enjoyed something until you praise it. Uh, praise completes, consummates the enjoyment. Wow, that just, that was a paradigm shift. So I thought, that's so important, I need to include that. And then, the letters to Malcolm, letter 17. If you're familiar with this book, how many of you have read letters to Malcolm? Oh, we got one, okay, oh, two, all right. So that may be one you want to run out and get. <laughs> um, if you're familiar with the book, you might remember that Lewis had some things he wanted to say about prayer. But he wasn't a trained theologian. And so he chose to write his book as a form of a collection of letters to a, an imaginary character named Malcolm. And also Malcolm's wife, Betty, shows up from time to time. And throughout the letters, he talks a lot about encountering the God who was beyond our description. The one who is, as he was off, would often put it, the bright blur. God, the bright blur, capital B, capital B. Well, in letter 17, Lewis int introduces what has become foundational for my own understanding of earthy spirituality. As the letter opens, he describes a life-changing ins insight about prayer as adoration, which he ascribes to something that his imaginary conversation partner Malcolm had taught him one day when they were in a on a long walk in a place called the Forest of Dean out in southwest England. Apparently, they'd been walking for some time, and it's a warm day, and they stopped by a brook uh, with a small waterfall, beside it, and, um, or, or uh, that was running over a small waterfall, and they were talking about what it meant to adore or worship God. And Lewis says, this is kind of early in that, um, maybe the first paragraph, Lewis says, I had thought one had to start by summoning up what we believe about the goodness and greatness of God, by thinking about creation and redemption and all the blessings of this life. Now, note what Lewis is addressing here. He's struggling to worship or adore God. And he knows he needs to do that. I know that I ought to be in my prayer. I ought to be worshiping in some way, adoring. But what often trips us up is we try to worship in response to abstract theology or abstract theological constructs, theological ideas. I can remember sitting in church and we'd be talking about the doctrines of the faith. And I remember thinking like, wow, I know I ought to be feeling some fervor in response to these ideas, but the dial is not moving. What's wrong with my faith? Um, 
And, and so that's kind of what he's struggling with, the trying to summon up some intensity of feeling in an effort to worship. But he just can't do it. And then Malcolm turns to this brook and once more scoops up some water and splashes his burning face and asks, why not begin with this? And here's what Lewis says next. And it worked. Apparently, you have never guessed how much. That cushiony moss, that coldness and sound and dancing light were no doubt minor, very minor blessings compared with the means of grace and the hope of glory. You got to say that in a theological voice, you know, the means of grace and the hope of glory. So then they were manifest, but then they were manifest. So far as they were concerned, sight had replaced faith. They were not the hope of glory. They were an exposition of the glory itself. Notice that last line, this cool water splashed on their faces, the light, the color. These were an exposition of the glory of God. You see what he's capturing here. In this moment, he is experiencing the glory of God unmediated by language, unmediated by abstract thought. He goes on to say, yet you were not, or so it seemed to me, telling me that nature or the beauties of nature manifest the glory. And you'll notice the word nature has quotation marks around it, and it's capitalized as a way of signaling that when he's talking about nature as an idea, he's talking about an abstraction versus the visceral experience of the beauty itself. Lewis says, no such abstraction as nature comes into it. It's like the abstract doctrine is a label placed upon the visceral encounter with the glory. And so he says, I began to learn the far more secret doctrine that sensory pleasures are shafts of the glory. That is the glory of God as it strikes our sensibility. As I mentioned a moment ago, Lewis will speak of God as the bright blur the one who dwells in unapproachable light, the God who is pure being, God the unnameable, God the ineffable, God whose glory is beyond our knowing or grasping. And yet somehow this glory, the, uh, the glory of this God who is the bright blur strikes our human senses and we experience it as pleasure. What a thing to say. And then he says, as it impinges on our will or our understanding, we give it different names, goodness or truth or the like. But its flash upon our senses and mood is pleasure. Now, I had already, I had, I've read this, I don't know, I was going to say hundreds of times. That's probably an overstatement, but it feels like hundreds of times. And I never got this. I always saw this as a throwaway line, almost as an aside. But then one day it hit me. Lewis is here invoking, maybe a little coyly, the doctrine of the transcendentals, the trinity of fundamental qualities that are intertwined in the very being of God, which was a staple of medieval theology. Without actually using the word beauty, what he's describing when he talks about the cushiony moss, the coldness and sound and dancing light, uh, represent glimpses of beauty. But instead of calling them beauty, he calls them pleasures. And in this way, he signals his understanding of how beauty, which is the incarnation of the glory of God, God's kenosis, comes to us. It comes to us as pleasure. The writer that helped me un unpack this uh, insight is the 20th century Swiss theologian, Catholic priest, prodigious scholar, Hans Urs von Balthasar, who titles his work on theological aesthetics, seven volumes long, The Glory of the Lord. And his work centers around this question, how do we as humans encounter this glory? Like Lewis, perhaps even influenced by Lewis, we're not sure, he recognizes that the glory of the Lord as it exists in the Trinity is inaccessible and unknowable to us. God dwells in unapproachable light. 
And so we encounter that glory as it is made manifest in specific forms, concrete incarnations of the glory which we receive with our senses. And so he titles the first volume of that series, Seeing the Form. For that is what we must learn to do if we are ever to know God. And what we see when we encounter this glory as it is incarnated in specific, concrete, physical manifestations is beauty. And of course, although he sees that beauty manifested in multiple facets of God's creation and creativity, in human creativity, the central incarnation of beauty is Christ. Now, Balthazar is passionate and eloquent for Christians in his call for Christians to recover and embrace the central place of beauty in the character of God in the Christian life. He writes, beauty is the word that shall be our first. Beauty is the last thing which the intellect The thinking intellect dares to approach, since it only dances as an uncontained splendor around the double constellation of the true and the good in their inseparable relation to one another. So you get a sense of these three core qualities of God, goodness, truth, and beauty, all dancing around the glory of God. He warns about what happens to truth and goodness when we marginalize beauty. In a world without beauty, The good also loses its attractiveness, the self-evidence of why it must be carried out. Again, think about Isaiah. Isaiah sees the beauty, the glory of the Lord, and yet that prompts him to desire holiness. He desires goodness, and the motivation for that is the encounter with the beauty. He says, Balthazar, man stands before the good and asks himself why it must be done rather than its alternative evil. Why should we do good? In a world that no longer has enough confidence in itself to affirm the beautiful, the proofs of the truth will have lost their cogency. Uh, In other words, syllogisms may still dutifully clatter away like rotary presses or computers, which infallibly spew out an exact number of answers by the minute, but the logic of these It is itself a mechanism that no longer captivates anyone. Truth and goodness lose their appeal. They lose their power to move us when we kick beauty out. Well, there's a lot more that I want to say about uh, Balthazar, but I'm going to move um, to um, a little bit of a shift to one particular element um, about the experience of beauty that runs through Balthazar and also runs through the writings of Lewis. We see hints in Balthazar um, of something that we see in Lewis, and it has to do with beauty as a form of eros, the erotic character of beauty. For Lewis, this is what gives beauty its mystical quality. For Lewis, this is why being worshipfully attentive to beauty has the potential to make attending to beauty and pleasure as a gateway to the mystical encounter with God. Now, the first thing I need to say, when we're talking about beauty as arrows, we're not talking about sexual pleasure. (laughs) Instead, we're emphasizing how when we encounter beauty, we become swept up, transported, overcome, enraptured in its presence. It is the realization that we respond to beauty as lovers, as do the living creatures in Revelation 4 who encircle the throne of God in that scene mark my power and majesty and excruciating beauty who cry out in ecstasy, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of the glory of the Lord. When Balthazar talks about how our church mothers and fathers received the truths about God that they were discovering, he calls them amateurs, lovers, enthusiasts. We think of those church mothers and fathers that we read um, almost as dry academics sitting in a library writing treatises filled with abstract theology. But Balthazar insists that they were ecstatics caught up in the unity of enthusiasm and holiness, caught up in what he calls the eros 
of theological inquiry. Perhaps the place where Lewis describes the, this texture of beauty in greatest detail is his book, The Four Loves. Lewis begins by distinguishing between two fundamental categories of love, what he calls need love, which is rooted in our neediness as humans, and gift love, what we call agape. God's love for us is pure gift. It is agape. Our love for God is entirely a need love. But then Lewis notes the strangest thing. There is a form of human experience that seems to reside in an odd in-between place between need love and gift love, what he calls the pleasure of appreciation, the sense of pleasure that washes over us when we experience things a beauty for which we really have no need. Now, need pleasures, the pleasures that fulfill some need, these are pretty clear. These are the pleasures that come when we anticipate and then find a need satisfied. So you're really thirsty, and then you get a big glass of water. That's a pleasurable experience. But then, once you've satisfied the need, the pleasure passes. As Lewis puts it, it dies on us. Think about the smell of bacon before you've had a good breakfast versus after you've stuffed yourself at the buffet. The smell of bacon after the need has been fulfilled is not so joyful. He talks about how seeing the word restroom over a door can rouse a joy almost worthy of celebration and verse. <laughs> the pleasure derives as much from a need inside of you as from any quality in the thing itself. And after the, the need is satisfied, the object no longer holds an attraction for you. But pleasures of appreciation are different. And this is where we begin to see the mystical encounter. Pleasures of appreciation are unsought and unexpected. They come over us through our senses. Lewis talks about the breath from a bean field or a row of sweet peas meeting you on a morning walk. I went for a walk this morning and the, the sunlight and the color and there was a little lake behind the Hampton Inn and there's uh, a, there's a mist rising off the lake, and it was, it was an experience of such beauty. Lewis says, you were in want of nothing. I didn't need anything in that moment. Completely contented. Before it, um, the pleasure may be very great. It is an unsolicited, super-added gift. These pleasures claim our appreciation by right because of qualities that dwell within them. It's like, again, that experience of walking past the field of sweet peas. We don't just enjoy the fragrance. We feel like the fragrance deserves to be enjoyed. To be inattentive or undelighted in this presence and presence of this beauty would in some sense be a moral failing. Our attention, we might even call it our homage to these pleasures, is a kind of debt that we owe this thing simply because it is what it is. To be inattentive or to, uh, to, to be enthralled by appreciative love, um, Lewis says, um, we gaze and hold our breath. We are silent. We rejoice that such a, a wonder could exist, even if not for us. Made me think of, um, of visiting uh, Yosemite National Park for the first time, if you've ever been there. You pay your money to get in. What I didn't know is that you drive almost an hour before you see anything. You're in the woods, just driving through this road in the woods, and you start, start down a hill. Um, and then uh, you go through this tunnel, and when you get to the other side of the tunnel, it's like the view opens up, a, a point called Inspiration Point. And um, you pull in a little parking lot, and you just stand there with all these other people that you've never met before, from every tribe and nation, people from all over the world, and you just stand there and you gaze at Yosemite Valley and you see El Capitan and then you see Half Dome off in the distance. And it just, it just evokes this in you. Well, 
without coming out and saying it explicitly, what Lewis is describing here is eros, the experience of being in love. Think about what it feels like to fall in love. Ever had a crush on somebody? Of course you have. All those tingling sensations that come to us when we have a crush on somebody. In his wonderful memoir, The Sacred Journey, Frederick Buechner describes this moment. He's almost 13. He's living on the island of Bermuda where his mom had taken him and his brother, perhaps to explain the, uh, to escape the pain and shame of his father's suicide a year earlier. One day, he and a girl the same age, 12 going on 13, were sitting up on the hill, sitting side by side on a crumbling stone wall, watching the ferries come and go out on the harbor. He says, our bare knees happened to touch for a moment. And in that moment, I was filled with such a sweet panic of and anguish of longing for I had no idea what, that I knew my life could never be complete until I found it. Note the sense of aspiration that comes over him in that moment. Now, Lewis is careful to say, we're not talking about sexual activity here. Indeed, if you think about it, he says, your experience of falling in love is not typically centered in a sexual impulse. Instead, what you feel is more uh, a, a delighted preoccupation with the beloved, a general unspecified preoccupation with the beloved in his or her totality. When you have fallen in love in this sense, he says, you really don't have time to think about sex. You're too busy thinking about that person. And so he concludes, sexual desire without eros wants it, the thing in itself. Eros wants the beloved. In some mysterious but quite indisputable fashion, the lover desires the beloved herself, not simply the pleasure she can give. In his sermon, The Weight of Glory, Lewis will speak of how our longing and response to beauty, the beauty of nature, is a longing not simply to gaze at it from the outside, but to be united with the beauty we see, to pass into it, to receive it into ourselves, to bathe in it, to become part of it. As Balthazar writes, there is good reason why the word used here in response to the glory of God is amour, eros, and not caritas. And so in Lewis's writings, over and over, we get images of people being swept up in the eros of beauty. I'll mention just one as we close. In Pilgrim's Regress, the first book he wrote after his conversion, Lewis describes the main character, whose name is John, who turns out to be Lewis, and he's on this journey. Um, uh, he leaves the puritanical religion. Um, he is... Um, he has um, grown up with, he goes into kind of atheism and spiritualism and eventually makes his way back to the simple faith. But he describes this one moment in the life of this character, John. He's out for a walk one day, enjoying a respite from the demands of the puritanical religion that marked his life in the cruel landlord's house. He's walking along a stone wall and he sees the oddest thing up ahead. There is a window in the wall. And so he goes up and he looks through the window. And here's what happens next. Through it, he saw a green wood full of primroses. And he remembered suddenly how he had gone into another wood to pull primroses as a child very long ago, so long that even the moment of remembering, the memory seemed still out of reach. While he strained to grasp it, there came to him from beyond the wood a sweetness and a pang so piercing that instantly he forgot his father's house and his mother and the fear of the landlord and the burden of the rules. A moment later, he found that he was sobbing. He will describe those experiences where longing comes over him uh, with an almost sickening intensity. 
And it's not an accident that in Lewis's retelling of the Genesis story of creation, when he wants to send the main character to a place where he can experience paradise, Eden, Lewis sends him to Paralandra, Venus, Eros, the goddess who in mortals, he says, produces beauty and amorousness. But beyond simply evoking the sense of erotic longing, Lewis also gives hints about the role of beauty in our lives. He invites us to be attentive to beauty, to pleasure, to praise God, and in doing so, to find the presence of God viscerally in our lives. And to see that experience of beauty as a foretaste of what awaits us. At present, he says, in the weight of glory, we are on the outside of the world, the wrong side of the door. We cannot mingle with the splendors we see, but all the leaves of the New Testament are rustling with the rumor that it will not always be so. Someday, God willing, we shall get in. And as he wrote in the problem of pain, all your life, an unattainable ecstasy has hovered just beyond the grasp of your consciousness. You have never had it. All the things that ever deeply possessed your soul have been but hints of it. Tantalizing glimpses, promises never fulfilled, echoes that died away just as they caught your ear. But if it should really become manifest, if there ever came an echo that did not die away, but swelled into the sound itself, you would know. Beyond all possibility of doubt, you would say, here at last is the thing I was made for. Amen. Thank you.